that's in the EV book, um, as far as the theory, okay? So basically what we're going to be looking at is focusing on the electrical conduction system and what you're going to actually see on the EKG, okay? So um, this I just drew to give you a good idea about Remember, the SA node is the one that you want as a pacemaker of the heart. If it fails, the AV node will kick in, and um, obviously if that fails, you're going to be in trouble because the Purkinje's are going to kick in. Now, as we progress this week, we'll talk about MIs, okay, myocardial infarcts. And we'll be looking at the different sides of the heart. This is actually your inferior side. This is your anterior septal. And this is your lateral posterior. And when we start talking about MIs, again, we're going to see how these coronary arteries, if they're clogged, can actually cause necrosis to the myocardium, okay? And that's bad news when you have an infarct because that is obviously going to lead to more problems with the electrical conduction system, okay? It's going to cause major dysrhythmias in a lot of cases. Um, so as we look at this electrical conduction system, start with the basics. First of all, you want to see atrial contraction, and that is represented as your P wave. Okay, your P wave is atrial contraction, or it's also referred to as atrial depolarization. Now, what actually causes this to occur? If you remember, it's about the movement of the ions in and out of the cell. Your potassium and mag, your sodium, your calcium, going in and out of the cell. And yes, that's in different phases. And I actually have a picture of the theoretical action potential, but like I always say, let's talk plain English. Um, so basically what's causing this is the movement of those electrolytes in and out of the cell is causing this to occur at phases, okay? Now, when the ventricles are going to depolarize or contract, it produces what is called the QRS, okay? So that is ventricular contraction. And obviously, if you're looking at this, you may think it's doing it separately, but it's not, guys. It's simultaneous atrial and ventricular contraction, okay? So this is the basics. Other part of the basics is obviously the heart filling with blood, and that is called the T wave. This is called ventricular relaxation or ventricular repolarization. So this represents your ventricles filling with blood. Because the impulse is so small when the atria fill, that's why you don't see it on the EKG. We only see the ventricular filling of blood. Okay. This part right here before the next heartbeat is called the refractory period. And that's very important to the myocardium as it gets ready for the next beat. And what you're going to learn is if we start having these ugly complexes coming in in this refractory period, the myocardium doesn't like it at all, okay? Because it needs that time to 
get ready for the next beat. So that is why, again, you want the pacemaker of your heart to be 60 to 100. So it has time to get ready for that next beat. Now, if your heart rate's like 130, this time is going to be very, very short. And that can be a problem in some patients. Okay? So, like, before you take an exam and your heart rate's like 120 because you've OD'd on caffeine, you know, you may feel a little jittery, but you're going to be okay. So, but some of our patients, they can't tolerate these high rates because the myocardium doesn't have that time to get ready for the next beat, okay? Now, another part of the basics is what we call time intervals. So, the time that it takes the atria to contract just prior to ventricular contraction is called the PR interval. Okay? Now, there should be a certain time for that. And most books list 0 0.06 to 0 0.20 is about where it should be, seconds. So why is that important? Because when we go over like a block, let's say you've had a myocardial infarction that you had all of this was plaque. Okay? So you actually infarct this side of your heart. So this is, when I say infarct, guys, I mean dead. That is dead. And there's no reversing it. That's why it is so important. Like this week, we're going to learn about things we want to do so that this does not become dead. Now, when this is dead, see, this is going to impact what? Your SA and AV node. And that can cause problems, such as a block. And instead of having 0.20, that time is like um, 0.28. And that can be a problem for that patient. Okay? We also have a time interval for the ventricles to depolarize. Okay? That should be very sharp, fairly narrow, but what is that interval? It's about 0.04 to 0.11 seconds. So theoretically, you pretty much want this time frame to be less than 0.12 seconds. Okay, why again is that important? Well, for example, you've got certain medications such as antidysrhythmics that if you get too much of that in your bloodstream, say because you have renal failure, then this can be 0.16 seconds. And that, again, can be a problem for your patient. So there's reasons that we look at that. There's another one, but I'm not going over it. And it's called the QT, and it covers all of atrial ventricular contraction and repolarization. Okay, for those of you that are out in the field, that's your QT. Now, on the EKG, when you are looking at rhythms, and yes, every rhythm pretty much on your test is a six-second 
second strip. Okay? For those of you who work with EKGs, you're going to see these little marks either at the top or the bottom of the paper. These are called hatch marks. And from here to here represents three seconds, and from here to here is three seconds. So what we're looking for is a six-second strip. Now, the easiest way to calculate a heart rate is to count, does everybody see that? The number of R waves in the six-second strip. So let's say you have eight of these in the six-second strip. Then you simply multiply that by ten. And that's going to give you an approximate heart rate of 80 beats per minute. Now that's the easiest way. For those of you who are into this, you can see me and I'll give you the exact. But for the basic general nurse, and I've already looked at the NCLEX test plan, of the rhythms that you guys are going to see or potentially could see on NCLEX. So that is why we are having to go, we go over this, okay? Because any one of you, even though you may not work cardiac, you could potentially have certain strips on NCLEX. And it may ask you to calculate a rate. So the easiest, and we'll look at actual strips, we're going, to count, we're going to count the number of R waves in a six-second strip and multiply by 10. That will give you an approximate heart rate, okay? Again, these are the basics. The, you know, for me, it's the need to know. If you can't get this, then we're in trouble. Now, on the EKG paper... And I'm going to show you these little tiny boxes are worth 0.04 seconds. Now, why, do you, why is that important? No, I am not going to have you measure PR interval. But I do think you need to know normals. Why? Because you could have a question that says this patient's PR interval is 0.28 seconds. What medication is that nurse going to question? What types of medications would you question if that time interval, interval is delayed? Beta blocker. Beta blocker. Perfect. Because you know that time is longer than it should be. So you need to memorize your norms. I've got them on the PowerPoints. So you can look at that. What you're going to see on the EKG paper is that you have these tiny boxes and then you have that makes up the larger box and there's five of those and you simply, it's five times 0.04 is 0.20 seconds. So we'll actually go over that on the EKG paper, okay? Now, why do you always look for normal? Well, as a nurse, if you can't figure out normal, so with normal, what do you want? You want a P wave before every QRS. Now, what does that mean in plain English? That means the atria are contracting and the ventricles are <coughs> contracting. Okay? So you want a P wave before every QRS. That means all chambers are contracting. You want the R to R's to 
to be regular. Okay? Not irregular. So you want the R to R to be regular. That means the distance between this QRS and the next B or next QRS is regular. Okay? That it, it marches through the strip. Again, I've said this before, you want the rate to be theoretically 60 to 100 beats per minute. You want your PR interval within normal range and your QRS within normal range. <laughs> so this is what you're looking for. Because you're going to be looking at rhythms. That didn't happen. Okay? Something's not right. Okay? So, what is confusing here? You got it? These are some of the basics. Okay, that you need with monitoring strips or seeing a strip on NCLEX. Okay, for example, if this interval was delayed, say it was 0.28 seconds, what might the nurse question? Yeah, anything that's going to slow that heart rate. Okay, so that's where this comes into play that you could see, potentially see on NCLEX. No, we're not going to measure PR intervals. We'll do that in clinical for those of you who are on the cardiac areas. Now, when you say uh, slow, when you say anything that slows the heart rate, will, will that be just in the P wave or could it be in the QRS? Could be the QRS. Could be anything that yes. slows the heart rate. Yes. Yes, and my point being that's why you need to know norms. Because the question could reflect a medication. Okay. And, well, we'll get to this in a minute. I don't want to confuse you. Okay, so I've learned to stick with the basics. And then we're going to actually start looking at strips. And of course, the first strip we're going to address is called normal sinus rhythm. And normal sinus rhythm falls into this criteria right here. Okay, so that's where we're moving to. So I sent, I think it says EKG on doors. I tried to get them all up. <coughs> you probably do, but there's not. Um. Yes, I renewed my CCRN for another three years. So CCRN is Critical Care Registered Nurse Certification. Okay, first of all, another basic. What really controls your heart rate and blood pressure? It's the good old autonomic nervous system. So if you have sympathetic stimulation, you increase heart rate and blood pressure. Parasympathetic, you decrease the rate. Um, again, if you have something that blocks the sympathetic system, then that's going to do the opposite or decrease heart rate. Okay, so A and S. Okay, um, these I just put up as terms. I think I did that before because you can see these in like a drug book, okay, um, as far as your medications. 
this is talking about the exchange of the electrolytes or the ions within the myocardial cells and that is actually what causes the contraction and filling of the myocardium. This is the actual theoretical action potential and you can see this occurs in different phases. Okay, so just FYI, you know, that's just so you know I not stand up here talking about an electric eel. You know? <laughs> I mean, this is what the actual movement of the electrolytes causing the depolarization and repolarization. And you may ask yourself, well, why is that important? Well, what's going to happen to this um, heartbeat, essentially is what this is, if your potassium is 2.9, is that going to affect this? Yes. Oh, yes, it is. That's why you got to know labs. If your sodium is 125, yeah. oh, it's going to affect it. The myocardium does not like drastic changes, in particular, these electrolytes. And you can probably throw mag in there, too. Okay. So those are very, very important. I'm sorry. Um, this is showing, again, polarized, that means the, elect the myocardial cells, what does that mean? The myocardial cells have the potential to initiate an impulse and respond to that impulse, okay? That's what that essentially means. So we went through depolarization, the electrolytes are moving in their phases, and then they move back with the repolarization. Now remember, electrical activity is before, just immediately before the mechanical contraction. Okay, so if you have, what does that mean? If you have a rhythm that is not depolarizing, well, you don't have any blood flow. <laughs> You're going to die, okay? So that's essentially what that means. I went through this, you guys know the SA, it's just a repeat, AV, and Purkinje. Another big little picture here for you that you can look at as well of the electrical conduction system. Um, Again, how do we record this? I think the majority of you have probably seen we put electrodes on certain areas of the chest and limbs. That cable's connected to a monitor, and then when that patient's rhythm, that's how that rhythm can be seen on the monitor, okay? So it's electrodes and EKG leads that go, that cable goes to the monitor and that's how you see the actual EKG, okay? Now, when you are um, looking at the electrodes, this picture basically gives you the foundation of how you would do an EKG. So you're going to put, and they're pretty idiot proof now, okay, unlike my old day. And in fact, there's a lot of controversy now in the literature about going to disposable um, leads. The leads are this, okay. The electrodes are that little circular thing or rectangular thing that has a little uh, point to it that you attach the lead to. Okay, but you're going to have limb leads, that's right arm, left arm, left leg, right leg, and then you have chest leads or precordial leads, and you can see these are placed um, V1, V2, 
three, four, five, and there's even that to get a 12 lead EKG. There's now 15 lead EKGs, and I think there's 18. Okay, so there are ability to get more um, leads. Now, why is this important? Because with a 12 lead EKG, you're seeing all these different views of the heart. The inferior side, the anterior septal, uh, the posterior lateral. So you're getting all these different pictures of the heart. So that's why um, if, you know, your patient's got something funky going on with their rhythm, you want to get a 12-lead EKG. Now, if you work like in CCU um, in particular, most um, CCUs you're going to monitor in two leads. So what does that mean? Two leads means I'm getting at least two different views of that myocardium. Does that make sense? Okay. So, um, what I do with that? so that's basically what you're doing. Okay, is looking at the different views of the heart. Okay. Now, I don't have any issues. Okay. These leads have positive and negative. Okay, kind of like a battery, you know, positive and negative for something to work. Well, that's what these are, okay, meaning that, um, you know, like this would be positive um, and this would be negative. Okay, so there's positive and negative on the leaks. Okay, why? That is so the impulse is going to be picked up either in a positive direction or a negative direction. So if you've ever seen an EKG, most of my nursing students like that typical picture I drew. They want the P wave upright and they want the QRS upright. Okay? They don't want to see that P wave like this and the QRS like this, okay? Well, just FYI, what causes that, when the impulse from the heart is traveling towards the positive lead, you're going to get an upright deflection. So, in other words, like for you guys, you like for the impulse to travel to the positive lead. Because you like that nice positive deflection, meaning upright. But if that impulse is moving away from the positive, which it does on a 12 lead EKG, that's why you're going to see that negative deflection. Okay? So that's just to let you know why you're seeing positive, upright, QRSs and downward QRSs. It's because of how that impulse is traveling. Okay, on the EKG. But they're the same? Yes, same myocardium, same impulse. It's just to see the different views of the myocardium. And if you go and work in telemetry or CCU or ED, you actually learn to read the dang things, okay? Especially in the unit, okay? Okay, so with the leads, you've got limb leads, you've got chest leads, okay? And usually we have what is called a grounder to simply prevent interference. But that's basically the leads. And just to know why you see impulses upright and downward. And I put that in there because students would always ask me. Now, if you're obtaining an EKG, most places now have EKG techs. Um, 
You need to make sure that those electrodes, the sticky thing, is not over hair or over bone because you want a good, good pictures of the heart. Okay. <clears throat> I wanted to get to normal sinus rhythm, and then we'll take a break. Um, this is just more, it's just a picture of the positive to negative and how you would see an upright deflection versus a negative deflection. That's all that is. Okay, now the fun stuff. The EKG paper. This is an enlarged picture of what it looks like. So what I've done here is this is your P, and here's your PR interval, your QRS, and your QRS interval, and your ST, your T wave, is the heart contracting or filling? Filling. Filling, okay? And don't look at that. So, and then you see, here's its little resting period, getting ready for the next beat, okay? Now, on your EKG, this small little box is .04 seconds, okay? .04 seconds. And that's how you measure your PR. So that would be one, two, three and a half times point zero four is like point one four. Okay, or three of them would be point one two. Okay, this one you can see one two. Two blocks eight. times point zero four is point zero eight seconds. So that's how that is done, okay? So that's your basic uh, picture of your paper. Okay, so we went over that, and multiply by 10. If you want to know the details, then I'll give you that. And this is just showing you the paper. Like I said, these hatch marks are divided from here to here is three seconds and here to here is three seconds. And you can see, looking at R to R. And so you're gonna be looking at that for regularity, okay, with that. Okay, so let's look at normal. So, 
What type of rhythm is this? Normal sinus rhythm. This is what you want. And you want the rate to be theoretically 60 to 100. Why? Because that should indicate adequate perfusion. Okay? Okay, let's take a break. Go ahead and take 10 to 15 minutes. What is a heart rate? 40. 50. 50. 50. Okay, it's 50. 50 beats per minute, okay? Now, if you were to, to march it out, it is regular, okay? When the rate is, is theoretically less than 60, we call that sinus bradycardia. Okay, um, it is still coming from the SA node. It's just the rate is less than 60. Sinus bradycardia may or may not be a problem for your patient. Okay, um, depending on what is going on with the myocardia. Okay, so rate less than 60 is sinus bradycardia. And again, it's regular and all the other stuff is fine. Now the next one, what's the rate here? Okay. 110 beats per minute. Okay. Now, like I said, this may or may not be a problem, but notice that that resting period or the refractory period is short. It's now short. So that means that can be a problem because there's not enough time for the heart to get ready for that next beat, and that can affect your perfusion. Okay? When the rate is above 100, it's still coming from the SA node, this is called sinus tachycardia. Okay? Sinus tachycardia. This may or may not be a problem. But I can guarantee you if this patient with the inferior wall pretty much dead, and they have a rate of 110, what's going to happen to their perfusion? It's going to go down, okay? So, again, may or may not be a problem for your patient. Um, things that can cause an elevated heart rate are pain, caffeine, um, certain uh, uh, bronchodilators such as albuterol, those can cause an increase in heart rate. What can cause a decrease in heart rate? Digoxin, ditch toxicity, overdose. Um, So there are different things that can cause these to occur, okay? Also, some of your elite athletes, because their heart pumps so much blood to their body effectively, they don't need a rate of 60 to 100. So a lot of your elite athletes have slower heart rates because their myocardiums can pump so much blood with one beat. Okay? So may or may not be a problem is my point. So another good point to make with this is this is an additional tool. Nothing replaces your assessment of the patient, okay? So, if you're dodo nurse and all you're doing is staring at this, well, you're not doing your patient the service that they deserve, okay? So, it, it's an additional tool. Okay. 
This is where uh, it can get a little bit confusing. Okay. <coughs> this is one of the the most common atrial dysrhythmias. Okay, atrial dysrhythmias. Now, if you notice, don't. Okay, you may say, "Oh, that's a P wave." That's does that look like the P wave I showed you? No. No. That is not a P wave. First of all, it doesn't measure out. Look at your R to R. Is it regular? No. So what is happening with this patient? Again, this is classic with like COPD patients, um, patients that have had myocardial infarctions. Um, this is actually what the, my, the atria are doing is what we call fibrillating. Okay? Now, the atria are actually emitting impulses at like 250 some beats per minute when they fibrillate. Okay? So, if you'll think of again that bowl of jello shaking, if you were to slice open the heart, that is pretty much what the atria look like. But they are emitting these impulses, they're called fibrillatory waves, at up to 250 beats per minute or even more. So the beauty of the myocardium, right, no matter what, it will try to keep beating no matter what. This little special AV node as a compensatory mechanism will do everything in its power to blot as many of those fibrillatory waves from getting to the ventricle. Okay? So, in other words, that's why you only see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Because the ventricle, the AV node is blocking as many of these impulses that it can before they progress into the ventricle. Now guys, I'm going to tell you, there are patients that they, their AV nodes do this, and then there are other patients, such as those with dead tissue, that don't work very effectively. This is the rhythm that is no distinct P wave, irregular. It's called an irregular, irregular rhythm. It is the rhythm with an apical radial deficit. So if you were to auscultate um, at the apex and then palpate, you need two people to do this, palpate the radial the rates could be different. It's called an apical radial deficit. So, no distinct P wave, irregular, and the rate can vary. These are the ones you can see the rate go from 80 to 120. So, the rates can vary. This is called atrial fibrillation. The problem with this rhythm is when your atria are now a bowl of jello shaking, one, you're at risk for clots. Two, you are losing up to anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of your atrial kick, which helps with cardiac output. Now, to let you know, we have patients that stay in this. We call them our chronic a fibers. And what do we do and what does the physician do? We make sure their heart rate is controlled, preferably 60 to 100, and we give them medications that can, hit, that can enhance perfusion such as digoxin, 
right? Are you with me? Do I need to repeat that? For those of you who are not exposed to rhythms, this is your more common, most common atrial dysrhythmia. Atrial fibrillation. No distinct P wave, irregular. Okay? Sometimes students ask me, why is it so common with COPD? And that's because your pulmonary vessels are constricted, right? From years of smoking, 30, 40 years of smoking. Those pulmonary vessels are constricted so that right ventricle has to pump against that and over time that causes the atria to enlarge or hypertrophy which makes them classic for atrial fibrillation. Okay, the most common atrial dysrhythmia. So one, as a nurse you should ask about some type of anticoagulant Two, you should do a thorough assessment of perfusion. Three, always assess ABA. The nurse who does not assess this ABA is not getting an accurate heart rate. And you know nowadays it just burns me up. Those dang machines are like God's gift to mankind. So thinking nurse would look at this differently. Okay. Now, let me throw a thinking question at you. Your heart now has a dysrhythmia. Your heart is not pumping as effectively. <coughs> Perfusion is now compromised. Okay. What if your potassium is 2.5? What's it going to do? Decrease perfusion even more. It's going to decrease perfusion even more because the heart is going to start doing other things because it's already compromised and now it doesn't have adequate potassium. So it's going to start throwing other type of impulses. Right? That is why in your cardiac patients, those electrolytes that I have mentioned are imperative to be within the normal range. Okay? It's going to be my cardiac nurses, telemetry nurses that give potassium, diuretics, calcium, magnesium. You know, you guys are going to be doing that a lot. We do it all the time on IP. You know, IP is like a mini step down or something. So, again, atrial fibrillation. Okay. Okay, another common atrial dysrhythmia that you may see. That's another picture. Oh, no, no, no. I don't want to throw that at you now. We'll come back to that. Okay, another common atrial dysrhythmia is called atrial flutter. Atrial flutter produces, these are called flutter waves. They produce these sawtooth waves. Okay? They're called flutter waves. Now, as you can see, the AV node's doing a pretty good job of one, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. That's called a three to one conduction. So the AV node's doing a pretty good job at blocking those flutter waves from getting down into the ventricles. Okay? Now, what does that mean with atrial flutter? One, you're looking for those sawtooth waves. This rhythm can be regular or irregular. Okay, so don't confuse them. 
Atrial fibrillation is always erected. Atrial flutter can be regular or irregular. Why? Well, look at those flutter waves. See how big they are? How prominent? Look at these. You see that? The AV node can see the flutter waves better. It can detect them better. So that's why it can be regular or irregular. Again, the same principle applies, guys. You've lost your atrial kick, and you're at risk for clots. Now, this is the rhythm, though, I will tell you. Um, it's much easier to <laughs> cardiovert. Do you guys know what I mean when I say cardiovert? You're taking an EKG... And instead of defibrillating or sending joules through the myocardium at a high number, a high number of joules, you're actually synchronizing with the R wave. And you're delivering a, a lower number of joules to get them out of this room. Okay, but the point being, atrial flutter, atrial fib. Okay, it can be regular, irregular with this Okay, so looking at that, if you were to see those on a test, could you identify those rhythms? Maybe after you spend a little time. Okay, and your strips will be your textbook line. Okay, so sawtooth waves, flutter waves. These are your fibrillatory waves. This one is always irregular, atrial fibrillation. Some students, FYI, some students ask me, can you have fib flutter together? Yes, you can. What does it look like to you? Is there a P wave before every QRS? Okay, is it regular? What's it going to be? Atrial fibrillation. Okay, what is that rhythm? Is there a P before every QRS? Okay, is the R to R regular? No. It's slightly early here. Okay. What's your rate? What is it? 50. 50. So sinus bradycardia. Okay, we're going to call it sinus bradycardia. Okay. What does that look like? See? Y'all can see those sawtooth. Has that distinct sawtooth pattern. Okay. What is that called? Atrial flutter. Very good. Okay. Now let's go into the biggie, which is the ventricle. Okay. With the ventricle, you remember what I said about those electrolytes? And when they're out of whack, that the myocardium doesn't like it. Okay? And when it's not happy, it is going to let you know that it's not happy. Okay? These are called irritable, it's called irritable foci. Okay? But to you, when you see this very wide and bizarre QRS, that is called a premature ventricular contraction. It's early in the beat, and notice it's wide and bizarre. 
That is because there is some little spot down in this ventricle that's not happy. Or you could have just had a myocardial infarction and you've destroyed tissue. Okay? So premature ventricular contraction. You can actually have these, okay? Some of you may have felt like you had a little feeling because you didn't sleep and you've OD'd on caffeine and you've just caused a little irritability here, okay? But um, when is this a concern? When we start seeing them frequently, or in patterns, or together. Okay, this is your patient saying, hello, you might want to come in the room. Okay, when you have three PVCs together, that is called ventricular tachycardia. So this is your patient saying, hello. Okay, my heart's in a little trouble right now. Okay, when there's three in a row, it's called ventricular tachycardia. When do you get concerned? When you see a lot of these, or there's a pattern, or they start coming together. Okay, because it's telling you this little part of my myocardium or wherever is not happy. Okay, you better do something. <clears throat> now I was going to show you if I never hit this stupid thing in the front. Okay, now here again is three in a row. Wide and bizarre. QRSs are wide and bizarre. You can have PVCs in a pattern every other beat, which is called bigeminy, every third beat, which is called trigeminy. A pattern is a warning to you. PVCs occurring frequently is a warning to you. If you were to have just two of these together, that's called a couplet. Three is a triplet. This is considered ventricular tachycardia. Your patient is warning you that something is not happy. That could be electrolytes out of balance. That could be a low oxygen level. Um, it, it's hard to say. Now, if these were to occur frequently and your patient is not happy at all, the myocardium, so now they're going to go into a sustained ventricular tachycardia. See, wide and bizarre QRSs. Okay? And 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Mm. So your ventricles are now firing these impulses from way down in the ventricle. Okay? If this patient, this is can be a lethal dysrhythmia. If your patient is pulseless, call the code. You need help. Your patient needs help. Start your compressions. You remember now, I don't know if you know, it's now compressions, airway, breathing, C-A-B. Start compressions. Okay? you are going to need a defibrillator. And we'll go over this some more when we get to codes. 
If you see this, your patient's pulseless, you need to defibrillate this rhythm. Okay? Pop sustained, pulseless, ventricular tachycardia. Okay? But hopefully, when you start seeing this, you're going to start thinking about all the possibilities and sustained VTAC doesn't happen. Okay? We hope not. This one you're not tested on, but again, just FYI, for those of you who are out in the field, you could see a question about this. When you, this is ventricular tachycardia, and when you see it almost on a spiral like that, you see how it's like that, okay? That is called torsades, torsades. That is due to a low magnesium level. Torsades, T-O-R, S-T-O-R-S-A-D-E-S. Torsades. What is, what is causing this? A low magnesium level. Why do I mention this? A lot of people die. <laughs> okay? Because even though you're pulseless, you're trying to defibrillate, because that mag is low, oftentimes they don't come out of it, okay? So torsades, a low magnesium level, okay? Is there a warning sign before it gets to that? Uh, could be um, just what I showed you, if I can find them again. When these start occurring frequently or in a pattern, the nurse needs to be thinking. Have we gotten electrolytes? If not, I don't want stat electrolytes. You know, what's the O2 level? You know, is the patient having pain? I mean, you start thinking at that point based on your assessment. What's going on? And this one, which is on... Let me see if I can get a better picture of it. This is more classic. On the NCLEX test plan, this is called sudden death. And this is called ventricular fibrillation. Now, don't confuse it. Students are like fibrillation, fibrillation. But there's a huge difference in atrial fibrillation and ventricular fibrillation. Okay, when your ventricles are now a bowl of jello, you are in dang trouble, okay? This, uh, okay, you're in trouble, okay? If they're pulseless, which if this is true ventricular defibrillation, fibrillation, you're going to be pulseless. Okay. This is why a lot of people die outside of the hospital. This is why, based on research, you now see your AEDs, right? Your defibrillators, where there's large crowds. Because with an adult patient, if they're pulseless and you're out in the field, this is probably what they're in. Okay, ventricular fibrillation. What's the first thing you're going to do? Call a code. You need help. You need that defibrillator. You're going to defibrillate this patient. Okay, they're pulseless. That's pretty much more of a classic um, textbook version. There's some others. Now I brought, I put this on here just so you could see 
Now, obviously, this is the one true arrhythmia, okay? Now, hopefully, if you want to see this on the monitor, you go flying into the room, and Mr. Jones decides he wants to wash himself from neck to here, and he's just taken those little <laughs> leads and said, I'm fed up, I want to do this. But he's talking. And that happens quite a bit, okay? You run in there, everybody goes flying in there, and the patient's standing there going, <laughs> and you're like, really? Really? Okay? Now, also, I want to let you know that this is the, uh, a rhythm you want to confirm in two leads. Why? because it actually could be what we call a fine ventricular fibrillation. Why is that important? Because I can, can probably defibrillate this patient and get them out of this. If it is true asystole, you're a goner. Okay, it's about all I'm saying. What you're going to learn about asystole is that usually there's underlying causes. Um, we'll talk about that in code lab. Um, and you don't defibrillate. So what are you going to do? We give epinephrine. So we give something that is going to cause the sympathetic nervous system to try and do something. Give me something. Okay. Um, but hopefully, check it in two leads. It could be a fine V-fib, and you can defibrillate it, okay? Now, I'm not going to go over. We'll go over these um, tomorrow. Um, and why did I put these on here? You are not tested on the blocks, but um, I'll go over these. We'll pick up in the morning about why this could occur, um, these blocks. Um, but I wanted you to understand why, and we'll go over that, why you may see what is called a paste rhythm. Why am I pulling out a paste rhythm? The dang thing's on the inflex plan. Okay, paste rhythm. Okay, so yeah, skip the blocks. We'll go over that tomorrow because I y'all are getting overloaded. Okay. So what do I want you to do when you get in your little quiet moment and you got your pot of coffee or whatever makes your little life happy? Is um go over. I want you reviewing. Um sinus rhythm, sinus brady, sinus tack, a fib, a flutter. And right now I'm talking about being able to recognize those strips, V fib and V tack. Okay? And I know for some of you, you're like, piece of cake, others, it's going to take more practice. Okay? And I'll put up, um, well, I don't know if I want to do that yet. I kind of want you just focusing on those. Tomorrow, I will, um, after class, if you're still listening, you're going to see this pacer spike in front of the QRS. So there's a pacer spike. You see that little spike? It's in front of the QRS. Now, can you have a V pacing? Of course you can, but this is just the one I found that I thought this more of a textbook pace rhythm. So you've got a pacer spike in front of the QRS, okay? Because why is that important? Because when we're talking about cardiomyopathy and we're looking at the possibility of a pacemaker, things that you would need to make sure you incorporate in teaching the client, um, critical things about that pacemaker, okay? So that's where we're kind of going with that. So tonight, look at rhythm interpretation. Um, we'll be doing that. Um, we'll go touch base in the morning with that. 
Um, and then actually we're going to be moving to chapter, hold on, 40. And then we're going to talk about that dead tissue I was telling you about. Myocardial infarction, okay, which affects a lot of people in this country, okay? So...